Good morning. I would invite you to turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And here this morning we come now to the next expression in the Apostle Paul's uh, description of how the church walks worthy. As we go through uh, Ephesians 4, more or less on the micro level, it's good to remind ourselves of Paul's intention in writing this section. And Paul is urging, of course, the, believe, the believers in Ephesus to maintain the unity which is theirs in Christ Jesus. Now, the important thing to note about this unity is that it cannot be created by any person or group of persons on their own. But this unity that we have been studying about exists within the Godhead. And so, out of the Godhead itself arises this unity that we are able to share and partake of together. The Godhead's unity translates into the believer's unity. And as we've been looking at each of these uh, one statements, there is one body because of the one spirit that indwells believers to give us one hope because we submit to the one Lord that is revealed in our one hope. Because of this reality, we are not free to do anything and everything we want. We're not free to believe everything other than what Christ has taught us. We're not free to believe in any way that we would desire. We're not free to live in isolation. Because in being united together, we are united to one another or being united to Christ, we are then united to one another. That this one Lord, that we can only have one master over us, this one Lord is the foundation of this one faith. And so when we read here that there is one faith, there's some kind of a debate about what, what is Paul referring to here when he says the faith or one faith? And I, as I studied for this lesson, I was impressed by the diversity of opinions, of interpretations. And yet really there were only three. Normally when you see a, a diversity of interpretations, there's a huge divergence of thought, even contradictory at times. However, that's not the case here. In fact, I have concluded in it from studying and reading uh, this last week that each of these positions flow from one another naturally. And we really do need to note this relationship. And so there are three types of faith that we will examine this morning and the relationship between them uh, will become apparent in due time. There's the subjective faith referring to uh, one's own personal faith. There is saving faith referred to as justification by faith, the gift from God that justifies a person. And then there is the standard faith the objective faith that we agree on and are bound by. So when we refer to the one faith, it, it in part is a reference to our subjective faith, our own personal faith. This faith is the quality and capacity in us which enables us to believe. Uh, there is a faith that all of us have and exercise. We all live in the realm of natural faith, and we exercise this daily. Now, some of this, for some of us, this may be the only exercise we have or do. But this faith is exercised when you sit in a seat that will hold and support you. 
I doubt that when you came in, you wondered what the weight capacity for these pews were, whether or not there were any cracks or uh, chinks in the, in the wood that holds these pews up. Uh, did you test whether or not it could sustain you for an extended period of time? Did you do any of that, or did you just sit down and throw your, uh, put your Bible down and maybe your purse, keys? No, you, you probably just set them down, didn't you? That's faith. You demonstrate faith when you turn on your car that all of the systems work and uh, they fire correctly. You continue to drive around with enough faith in people knowing and understanding how to actually drive. You put your faith in the people who cook your food at the restaurant, that they don't do anything improper while you're sitting at the table far, far away, divided by walls and in the back, while you sit and converse before your food comes out that they completely cook your food to the proper temperatures. And when they bring out your food, what do you do? Do you recook it yourself? Do you get out a thermometer and stick it into your burger and see if it's the right temperature? No, you, are, you do that by taking a bite, don't you? you are, you've already started. That's faith. We have no problem drinking water out of a facet, faucet with confidence that it's not going to be contaminated. We trust the bank when we give them our money to deposit into uh, my account. Now, if your money happened to flow into my account, that's a different story. But we have faith that they're going to do the right thing and do what was it was intended to do. We put our faith in doctors. We put our faith in surgeons, people who are educated in certain areas or uh, even in certain positions, that they are in higher positions than we are. And so I might defer to them on that basis. So it seems like our natural, like our natural birth produces within us natural faith, that I am willing to believe in people simply because. Now, should I test these people? We hear stories about it. You can read all the Yelp review, reviews you want about certain people. You can look at uh, court cases and how they discredit certain people. But by and far, you don't listen to those, do you? You go ahead trusting the people that you want them to do a certain thing or carry out an intended effect. Now, spiritual faith operates in this capacity as well. How often do we willingly accept and act on things that we do not understand? We have faith in things. We have faith in other people, but we also have faith in God. If we turn our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, we see an idea of what I'm talking about, a subjective, a personal faith. It is still in God, but it's different than the others that we will look at, of course, in relationship to God as well. But there's a subjective part of this. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. That faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, and for by it the men of old gained approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. Faith is living in a hope that is so realistic that it gives us assurance that it is true. That faith takes God at his word and lives on that basis. A Christian lives in certainty that whatever troubles or experiences in this life, that whatever we endure in this life and experience for Christ,
cannot compare to what we will experience and enjoy in eternity. So our assurance stems from our faith, the firm ground, and we wait for God's promises to be realized. And this assurance turns into a conviction when our assurance is manifested in our daily life, where we are committed and convinced of God's truth over and over and over again. Of course, as the Hebrew writer uh, alludes to, the greatest example of our own faith in God is with the very creation account. He mentions that in verse 3. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Now ask a scientist to recreate this or investigate this. They're not going to be able to explain creation that was out of nothing. And so there are also other areas of faith that we uh, direct towards God in a very personal uh, sense. There is a faith that receives, and this is we'll see more about this in a moment, as when we come empty-handed before God to receive Christ for salvation. There is the faith that reckons, that counts on God's faithfulness to deliver us. There is a faith that risk, that acts on God's promises and character. There is the faith that rest, that despite what is going on, we keep going because our confidence is in God. Now, this subjective type of faith, this personal faith, cannot be the only type of faith in view by Paul here when he mentions the one faith. Our individual faith resembles our affection for Christ, and our affections have been mentioned already in part when we talked about the one Lord. But we must also consider that a subjective faith is not a reliable foundation for the need of something objective in order to maintain unity. We are looking at objective realities that define our unity as believers together. So my own personal faith, and I I might have faith in you as a fellow believer, but that's not going to guarantee, that might unite us on some things, but it's not going to guarantee unity. In other words, the objective realities are what allow us to have subjective feelings. Subjective cannot be defined. It can't be defended. But an objective test can. And that objective test can still hold us, uphold our unity, even if we are struggling on a subjective personal level. Someone disappoints me. I lose some faith in them. It's hard to believe them for a little bit. Well, while I am working that out, am I still united with them in one faith? I would argue so. The situation in Ephesus could not uphold a subjective faith alone to foster unity. As we have seen before, if it weren't for something outside of themselves, they would not have faith in one another. They were divided as divided could be. Look at uh, chapter 2 and verse 11. Remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time without Christ, You are alienated from the citizenship of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise. You had no hope. You were without God in this world. They were divided geographically. They were divided spiritually. They were divided socially. They were divided politically. Every aspect of life, they were divided, and there was no chance that they were going to be united just because they wanted to be united. That was not 
they were not going to overturn centuries of division. And yet, here we see them becoming united in the one church, the one body of Christ. And they have the one spirit in them, right? How? Well, we look at verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly were afar off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. Christ was what united them. So that brings us to a different type of faith that is still a faith, the faith. That we have faith on a personal level, but there is also what Paul refers to as a justifying faith, the faith, our saving faith. And this, of course, deals with our salvation. And Paul frequently refers to our faith in reference to being saved. It is a matter of salvation. If you go to Romans, and let's walk through Romans just a little bit to see this thought unfold. Beginning in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, where he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, But the righteous will live by faith. If we go to chapter 3 and verse 26, for the demonstration of his righteousness at the present time, so that he, referring to God, would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Chapter 4, verse 5. But to the one who does not work, but believes upon him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. If we drop down to verse 16. For this reason it is by faith, in order that it may be according to grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, a father of many nations have I made you in the presence of him whom he believed, even God who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. In hope against hope he believed, so that he might become a father of many nations. According to that which, he, which had been spoken, so shall your seed be. And without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. And yet, with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to do. Therefore, it was also accounted to him as righteousness. Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was counted to him, but for our sake also, to whom it will be counted as those who believe upon him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he who was delivered over on account of our transgressions and was raised on account of our justification. So what are the results of being justified by faith? Paul answers that question immediately beginning in chapter 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, 
we boast in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also boast in our afflictions, knowing that affliction brings about perseverance. Perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not put to shame because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. And then if we go to chapter 10 and we look at verse 5, we see that Moses writes about the righteousness which is of law. He says, the man who does these things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will go up into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down. Or who will go down into the abyss? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is, the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, leading to righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses, leading to salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes upon him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on Him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He mentions this also in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And of course, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of work, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Which God prepared beforehand, so that we would walk by them. So just as natural faith seemingly comes from... Nat by natural birth. So faith is a gift <coughs> that comes from God. One of the old confessions says, The grace of faith whereby the elect are enabled to believe to the saving of their souls is the work of the Spirit of Christ in their hearts and is ordinarily produced by the ministry of the Word which also by the administration of the ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper, and prayer, it is increased and strengthened. According to John 1, 12 and 13, faith is the gift of Christ, and because Christ gives us faith, we have the right to become children of God. And if we are children of God, that makes Him our Savior. Now the gospel is all about the life and work of Jesus Christ. And this is the message that we need to hear. According to Romans 10, 14 through 17, as we just saw, it is the message of Christ that we listen to and obey that produces this fruit. Faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. So this is about Christ. What then is the message about Christ? Well, that would, what we would say is the gospel, right? And how is the gospel defined? We go to 1 Corinthians 15. If I make known to you, brothers, the gospel which I proclaimed as good news to you, the same language used in Romans 10, which also you received, in which also you stand. You remember Romans 5? This is because of justification, we are able to stand before God, by which also you are saved if you hold fast the word which I proclaim to you as good news, unless you believed for nothing. 
For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So we need to hear this message. We need to know this message. And we need to receive this message. What do I mean by that? Well, at the very heart of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection is the substitutionary, atoning sacrifice of Christ on our behalf, right? Isaiah chapter 53, verse, verses 4 through 6, He has taken our place. He has taken our sins. And in this great exchange, Christ has taken on our sin, and He died a sinner's death, so that we may have his perfect life and not die a sinner's death. Rather, we have Christ's perfect life. Justification by faith is essential to the gospel. Justification is a legal term. It describes what God declares about the believer, not what he does to change the believer that's in fact justification affects no actual change whatsoever it's a in the sinner's nature or character it's a divine judicial edict it changes our status but certainly it carries the ramifications guarantee other changes will follow we see this all the time in our daily lives a man and woman are getting married are they changed on the individual, very personal nature, or is their status changed? No, they're not changed on the level of their nature, but their status has changed. They are no longer, uh, say, fiancé to be married. They are now man and wife. They are now in union. What about a person on trial? I, during the trial, he is referred to as the accused. And when the declaration comes, the accused becomes either guilty or innocent. It's that declaration. <clears throat> now, justification is a divine verdict of not guilty, fully righteous. There's that substitutionary atoning work of Christ. It's the reversal of God's attitude toward the sinner. Whereas he formerly condemned us, he now vindicates us. Although, the, although we once lived under God's wrath, as a believer we now receive God's blessing. Justif justification is by faith. Romans 5.1 Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Galatians 3.24, Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. Justification is in the name of Jesus Christ. You were justified, according to Roman, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. Justification is by faith in the name of Christ, not by works. In Galatians 2.16, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ, not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. And of course, this occurs by the grace of of God in Titus chapter 2 chapter 3 rather in verse 7 so that having been justified by his grace we would become heirs according to the hope of eternal life but then justification is demonstrated by good works go to James chapter 2 verses 21 through 24 and uh, this has been a confusing passage 
uh, to many, especially in the Restoration Movement. But here, this has nothing to do with us being saved. But because we are saved. So when you approach this passage in that light, nothing to do with being saved, but because we are saved... When we read this, this will be much more easier to understand. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? That would contradict Paul, wouldn't it? But if we are talking about, well, this person is already saved, what works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. So remember, Paul's justification by faith is declarative. But what James is talking about when he says justification by faith is He's using it in the demonstrative sense. In other words, Abraham's willingness to offer Isaac vindicated his faith in God before men. Because he was saved, he acted according to that faith which was in him. He was already justified by God. So inevitably, a person who is justified by faith is a saved person. And it is Christ who builds his church and he adds to his church. We are together as one body indwelt by the one spirit, looking forward to our one hope while submitting to the one Lord, because we all, we all have been given faith from God. The salvation that we have comes from Jesus Christ alone, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. Thus, this faith is more than knowledge, where we hear and understand the words of the gospel. The faith is more than mental assent, to where we accept the gospel as fact. This faith is a trust that God and God alone acquits and restores sinners to Him who is infinitely righteous and just. And so the basis of this teaching on justification by faith is who does it because it would fail if it were up to us. So as we live life as the church and recognize our calling to walk worthy of our calling as an individual, I have faith in people that can unite some of us. Yes, we are united as a group of Christians because we have all been Given the same faith from God that leads to salvation, this is how the Ephesians were united. It's how we are united. And yet we simply don't coexist with our differences, do we? Rather, we are also united by one more type of faith. That is, we unite together over what we teach as well. We are united with our doctrine. Over doctrine. And so that is also the third use of faith in the New Testament that can be in light here. Referring to our standard faith, the objective faith. This is a reference to the whole body of Christian doctrine, the gospel, the message of the New Testament. Our one faith is the content of the revealed word of God. God's Word contains many truths, but all of them are harmonious facets of the one truth, which is our one faith. Oftentimes you will hear the emphasis on the, the. It is the faith. It's not just a faith or believe whatever you want. It is the faith. Our standard faith is demonstrated in numerous passages, such as Acts 13, 5 through 12, where it's taught, referred to as the Word of God, the right ways of the Lord, the teaching of the Lord. 
1 Timothy 4, it's the faith, the truth, the word of God. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, you are not to proclaim another gospel, or else you will be accursed, you will be damned, destined for destruction. So there is the understanding that there is one faith. You cannot add anything to it. You cannot take away from it. You submit to the one faith. And we are united with that teaching. Jude 3, we are to contend earnestly for the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. So here it demonstrates that there is a beautiful harmony in the gospel. There are no contradictions. That there can be no other religious message or doctrine that is pleasing to God besides the one faith. All who would be in fellowship with God and with one another must be united in the doctrine of Christ. Or as 2 John says, anyone who is opposed or teaches contrary to this doctrine must be rejected. And so as we consider what this one faith means and looks like, it needs to contribute to unity, right? After all, that's why Paul put it here in this list of ones, in this passage about unity. Socially, we are drawn by those who proclaim the name of Christ and follow Him. There is a desire to put faith in fellow Christians Salvifically, we are drawn together by what Christ has given to us. Everyone who is a Christian has been given faith by Christ unto salvation, the free gift of God. And scripturally, we are united together because we believe what the Scripture says. Our faith is in God and what He has revealed to us through His Word. We are united because we submit to Christ as Lord and we do what He commands us to do. Thus, when we take all of these aspects of our faith into account, we are truly united in the one faith. And it transcends all of these levels and you work all of these out together. They are in accord in a healthy relationship with one another. Let's pray. Father, I pray that we are unified by the truth of your word. I pray that we all have the faith, the gift of faith that leads to salvation and that we exercise that in your son, Jesus Christ, and how we live our lives, that because you have declared us to be righteous through Christ's atoning sacrifice on the cross, that we have an introduction to you, that we are able to be in your presence, accepted and seen as Christ is perfect without sin. Father, I pray that we have faith in one another, especially as believers, that we all work towards this unity which Paul mentions here in the one faith. Faith is a powerful reality. It transcends many different areas of life, has many shades of meaning, and yet when we put it all together, it is cohesive. And I pray that we not only comprehend these truths about the faith, but we live them out in our daily lives. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. My question for you this morning is, do you believe? If you do, do you, will you do as he says and submit to his word in every aspect of your life. We have that opportunity now as we stand and sing.